People need to understand that you cannot have the same chance of, of achieving a pregnancy at any time just by interference and by going to the doctor and having IVF. We've always been asked the same questions, okay, what do you do differently and why your results are, are, are better despite the fact that the majority of your patients are, are those who are supposed to be difficult cases who, who failed repeatedly elsewhere. So starting with the consultation, I think we, we always recommend and ask and insist that the patients actually bring with them or send to us before the consultation a summary of, of all the treatment that they had before, any tests that they might have done. We have solutions to a long list of things, provided that we know what happened before and how to change it. So that's the starting point. During the treatment, and I know being described by my patients and maybe other people as, as boot camp, it's very intense. It's not uncommon for people to actually have blood tests almost every day. We strongly believe that this is the best way to try and maximize the chances of success by staying on top of things. Egg collection, we don't really pay too much attention to the, the, the number of eggs. There's a good percentage of our patients, they're not very uh, high responders, so they, they don't produce a lot of eggs. I'd rather have maybe a smaller number of good eggs rather than a very big number of uh, eggs and, and obviously embryos that are not gonna give the patient the best chance of success. The other thing that we also do differently from most places is we actually keep an eye on the medication throughout most of the pregnancy, which is again unusual because I think in most places, once you get to six weeks and you had a scan and so on, I think most, most clinics would probably not uh, follow up the pregnancy beyond maybe six or nine weeks or something like that. But we tend to follow patients throughout at least 20 weeks and beyond. Uh, just to maximize the chances of the pregnancy going as as long as possible and hopefully having a baby at home. All of these things are, are probably additional things, but we believe that because of the type of patients that we get, all of these things help us maybe achieve may, uh, things that probably would have not been possible without this kind of approach. People need to understand that you cannot have the same chance of, of achieving a pregnancy at any time just by interference and by going to the doctor and having IVF. Nature plays a big role into this. And uh, obviously the chances of conception, whether naturally or with the help of, of treatment if the treatment is required, age is, is a crucial factor. The earlier people start and the, the earlier people seek advice if they have a problem, the chances are much, 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 much better. Once you, you hit, I don't know, 40s or early 40s or late 40s, then there is a, a problem which is to do with the, the natural performance of the ovary. It's not an illness. It's not something that you can go to the doctor to try and help you with. The earlier you, you know where you stand on the fertility journey and then plan your next steps accordingly, the better. There is a bit of a, in my view at least, a misconception that okay, only embryos that go to day five are, are the ones that you should use. The only reason why you can keep embryos to day five or day six is to try and, and maybe uh, improve the selection criteria if you have a, a lot of embryos, but if you don't have a high number of embryos that have been developed and grown into the lab, there's no point actually keeping them in the uh, culture media artificial environment into the laboratory. We may as well just put them into the natural environment as early as possible. It's not also uncommon here to do what we call a split transfer. So again, if, if, if the number is not great and we're not sure about the potential of the embryo to, to go to day five in the lab, we can maybe put a single embryo on day three. And then if we have maybe another two or three, just, just keep them under observation and then uh, the one that progressed to day five can be put back again two days later. So that's also something that we do quite commonly here. Preparation for the treatment till you get to the egg collection is, is, the, is the time of the treatment when you really can have individualization of the treatment. Once the patient gets into the lab, they all go into the same incubators under the same environment and so on. So there isn't really much of individualization once you get into the lab, which is against the concept of, of, of most people thinking that, okay, the, 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 the most important part is, is what happens in the lab. Yes, it is very important. But I think if, if you don't prepare the patient in the right way and don't get the patient into the lab at the right stage of, 
of her ovarian stimulation, the quality of the eggs are, are the best and all the rest of it. There's very little you can do in, in any lab. So uh, to me, the preparation building up to the day of the egg collection is where maybe 70% or 75% of the success rate lies. It's worth putting the effort and, 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 and be committed to this treatment and making sure that everything is done in the right way, no cutting corners. So regardless of the outcome, whether we are successful or not successful, everybody has tried his best. The clinic, the doctors, the patient, everybody. And, and I think people sometimes can handle failure if they know that everything has been done in the right way. There was no cutting corners. We, we, we didn't really, we, we did put the effort, all of us. And, and that's the intention, it's always been the attitude here. Without actually doing this extra effort, which is uh, maybe a lot for the patients to do, but that's, that's what gives them the best chance. It's a lot of us, it's, it's a lot of work for us as well. Uh, I think most, I mean, the, the patients know that we are always open seven days a week, uh, throughout the whole year, Christmas day, uh, New Year's day or whatever. So. We just believe that we have to be available because we need to try and, and, and be there when, when it's the best time for the patient's treatment rather than anything else. One of the things that we, we find and it's different here from, from most other places is actually paying maybe a lot of attention to the implantation potential because to me this is an area that is under-researched and it's not really something that is uh, looked at very seriously in most places. And I think the emphasis is always on the embryo quality and the number of embryos and all the rest of it, which is fine for uh, maybe a, a reasonable percentage of patients, but those who have failed repeatedly before, those who actually come with the diagnosis of unexplained infertility, there is very, very high chance that the problem is not in the embryos. It's actually in what happens next when the embryo go back. And, and sometimes people, if they've never been explained this kind of uh, concept and, and this kind of approach, it's something that is like new to them and, and it can surprise them. But sometimes this is where the, the success or failure depends on. We've been looking into this since 2002. So we always felt that there was a missing link in a, at least a third of the patients that, that seek help in various IVF clinics. And the results actually speak for themselves because that's something that we have offered since 2002. We've been able by appro approaching this problem in that way to help a lot of people where everything else has failed. We've got the evidence, at least from our own experience, to show that it does make a difference. We've always been open about it, we've published about it and all the rest of it, but I know it's a very gray area in medicine, it's very controversial and, and there are people who still debate it and so on, but there's no doubt in my mind that this is very helpful to, to, to a lot of patients who have struggled and failed repeatedly. For an embryo to implant and develop and grow, first of all, it needs to be chromosomally normal because an abnormal embryo that doesn't have the right chromosomal makeup is unlikely to, to, to implant. And if it does implant, it's unlikely to progress beyond days, weeks, or even months. But even if the embryo is normal, there is a series of mechanisms that needs to happen to make the body receptive to this embryo which is a very difficult area to explain in simple terms, but it could be to do with blood supply, it could, uh, it could be also something to do with hyperactivity of, of, I don't know, some natural killer cells or cytokines or whatever. So it's a combination of many things and there is no one treatment that is suitable for everybody. Some people actually, who are not very familiar with the concept, they try to give medication in the hope that, okay, let's try something. I think this medication needs to be given very carefully and, and cautiously and, and it has to be based on a proper assessment of the levels and, and the history of the patient and so on for a simple reason, because it can also, if it's, if it's given at the wrong dose at, or, or if it's not needed at a certain time, it can actually hinder the pregnancy. So you need to be very careful and it takes a long time to try and understand how this works and and when to do it and when not to do it when to increase the dose or to reduce the dose or even stop this medication so it's not like okay we've given the medication and it has worked and the patient is pregnant that they will need to stay on the same medication throughout sometimes you may have to stop the medication at some point 
because it has achieved what it has achieved. The body is in perfect balance and to continue to give this is an overkill. So, so it's not straightforward, but, but it's something that is definitely, definitely can make a big difference in success and failure. This is one of the reasons why things like egg freezing now has become very popular, uh, because at least it's kind of, a, of an insurance policy. So at least if somebody's not ready or not sure or whatever, then they can freeze some eggs and, and they can always use them if, if there is a need to use them. The reality is a lot of patients who actually freeze their eggs at a younger age are probably highly unlikely that they will need to use them because hopefully by the time they're ready they will be able to achieve a pregnancy and stuff like that. It may just give them the peace of mind and the reassurance that okay there is a fallback situation if there is a problem. A lot of people may not remember or may, or may not even know that we were the first clinic in this country and probably the first in Europe to introduce egg freezing back in 1998. And it was a big struggle to try to get a license from the HFEA and it was covered widely in the papers and, and it was a challenge and all the rest of it. Now it's, it's mainstream and it's available and, and a lot of people actually have resorted to it to try and just give them the, the, the reassurance about their future fertility and stuff like that. I mean, on a personal level, I, when I was a junior doctor, I used to enjoy very much doing obstetrics. And I would like to believe that I was very good at it as well. So I used to enjoy dealing with somebody in labor and seeing the babies and all the rest of it. So it was kind of a natural, I don't know, progression when you become more senior and so on, that to also work in something that maybe step before that, when you can try and help people who struggle to, 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 to have the joy of completing the family, having babies, to try and also help them start the journey. It, it's, it's a very, very privileged situation to be in, to be able to have such an impact on people's life and, and maybe something that will stay with, with them forever. So it's not like, okay, you're a doctor, you can operate on somebody, remove their appendix, and that's the end of the story. I mean, and, and it's really, it's, it's a very nice feeling. And very few people can actually say this about their job. So, I mean, I don't know how long it's going to continue for me personally, but I mean, as long as I'm capable, that's what I would like to continue to do. What do we do here? Okay, I might get more credit than most people because I'm sitting at the top of the pyramid or whatever, but it's a system and everybody in this place contribute to it. So you cannot achieve the, the, the success and the, 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 the commitment to work and so on from one person if the others are not doing the same thing. It's a collective thing. Okay, it might help if they can see that, okay, the supposedly the most senior person actually is very committed is here and so everybody follow, that's fine. But if they're not actually helping and if not doing the same things and committing and so on, I can't do anything. And we've always been very privileged that to have a very good team here. People choose to come here, I would like to believe because we're different, we do things that hopefully are gonna give them the success rate that was were not done elsewhere. And we're quite happy to try and explain to them and tell them why we do it and so on. And it's entirely up to the patient to, to either accept it and be comfortable with it because it's very important to have trust and believe in what the, the clinic is offering you. And if there is any doubt about this, then I think this, that would not be the right place for the patients. Egg freezing started in, in this clinic. Uh, embryo biopsy, which is now called PGTA and, and, and annual protein screening at the time, started in this in this place. And it wasn't it wasn't a walk in the park because we have to convince the regulator that okay there is merits into this. It's going to help a lot of people. There was a lot of resistance to it at the in in the first instance, but nowadays it's a standard practice. And you could say the same about the the, the treatment for implantation potential and so on.